Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Rowing Chat, the podcast for rowing. You might not know, but we started this podcast in 2013, and we think we're definitely the longest running, and we think we were the first rowing podcast. Now, as ever, I have a few wonderful sponsors who help to support the podcast and help us cover our overhead costs. The first one is a rowing retailer directory. During lockdown, I was thinking about ways that I might be able to help rowing businesses who were struggling for obvious reasons. And I came up with the idea of starting a directory where you can go to find a rowing business for your particular needs, bearing in mind that a lot of us are in different parts of the world. And so if you go to rowing.chat forward slash retailer, you will now find an enormous number. There's something like 400 separate businesses all listed there, and they're all in different categories. So if you're looking for oars, you will find the people who rep for the major oar manufacturers in different countries. If you're looking for boats, that is the biggest category. There are a large number of boat suppliers, but there's also gifts and coaching and rowing holidays and accessories so there and electronics and software so there's a lot of different things i would love it if you could go in and have a look um if you can see any that are missing there's a link at the top of the page for you to add a rowing business and obviously we'll get in touch with them and check that they're happy to be listed or just message me the second podcast sponsor is my latest edition of the rowing tales book you'll remember that i have published one of these every year since 2017. And this year, the I haven't even received my copy, but it is now live and published in the Amazon store and also for sale on Row Perfect UK. And it it's basically lots of short stories told by rowers about rowing and things that happen to them. And I hope that you'd find it a good possible Christmas gift for yourself or maybe for someone else. Um, If you would like to buy all four books, which would normally retail for £75 sterling, um, you can buy them direct from me for £35 plus shipping. So get in touch. Uh, My email is rebecca at caro.com and uh, we'll work out payment and so on uh, nearer the time. Now, I'm very, very pleased today to welcome to the podcast, Kath Bishop. Hi. Hi. And we are both Pembroke girls who learned to row <laughs> at university because probably somebody said you're tall, you, sh- you should row. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Now, Kath obviously has gone on to much greater and um, better things than me being an Olympian, but she's principally here uh, because she's written a book. And we'll talk a little bit about the book later. But Kath, introduce yourself to everybody and tell us a little bit about your personal background in rowing. Sure. Well, yeah, I didn't give too many details there uh, because I did have quite a sort of interesting uh, entrance into rowing, as it were. But uh, just in kind of broad terms, first of all, I learned to row at university. I was at Cambridge and uh, rowed in two boat races there and then went on to row for the Great Britain team at three Olympics uh, in Atlanta, Sydney and Athens. I won a silver medal in Athens and the previous year won the World Championships. And since then, I uh, had a career as a diplomat working for the British Foreign Office and specialising in conflict issues abroad, working in Iraq, working in, in Bosnia after the conflict, and uh, become a parent, which arguably has continued my experience of conflict without the travelling. And I now work for the last sort of six or seven years in leadership development, teaching at business schools, and working direct with clients, executive coaching, and developing teams and leaders. Well, that's really, really comprehensive. And isn't it interesting how we managed to blend some of the life lessons that we learned from rowing into our own choice of professional career? Yeah, I mean, lots of people will say, wow, that all sounds really different. But actually, the world of rowing consists of teams and diplomacy depends on negotiating teams. I mean, it's really not that that dissimilar, very high pressure, very high stakes, arguably quite a lot higher stakes. 
Um, you know, I know I remember finding it quite refreshing having thought that going backwards uh, as fast as I could in a boat was the most important thing in the world. To actually realise when I became a diplomat, there were quite a few other things on that list that came above rowing. And that gave me actually a wonderful sense of perspective. I joined sort of just after my second Olympics um, when I needed a bit of a break from things reflecting on whether I was going to retire or, or, or do one more. And um, actually getting that world perspective was so helpful for then returning to rowing and loving it and appreciating it and, and seeing it in a, in a really different light. So when you first joined, were you based in London? What was it that particularly brought you to the world perspective? Because you were a linguist as, uh, at university. Yeah, so I had studied languages, I had studied uh, international politics, and actually I'd always been interested in the world of diplomacy, but I put that off because I left Cambridge with the words ringing in my ears from a coach that you might have the potential to become an Olympian. And that was actually quite significant because when I arrived at, at Cambridge, I was very much not a sporty girl. Um, at school, I had struggled, you know, to to do well in sport. I was categorized as not the sporty one. The small, nippy, fast runners were the sporty ones. And I was very much not in that category. So that's yeah, so why I was sort of laughing at the beginning when you talked about kind of t picking oars up at Pembroke. I actually initially didn't sign up to start rowing because although they came up to me and said, well, you're really tall. Um, I thought, well, I'm not very sporty and that looks quite a full on sport. And it involves getting up really early in the morning. And, and that's actually not my plan for university either. <laughs> So I initially didn't sign up and uh, in fact, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do in terms of clubs or hobbies or whatever. I wasn't sporty. So there were all these sporty clubs, but I kind of thought, well, they're just not really open to me. And I wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just kind of got, got into life, you know, college life, academic life. And then about three or four weeks kind of into that first term, a lot of people who had become my friends were all doing this crazy novice rowing, getting up at hideously early times and loving it. And then coming back, buzzing, talking about it at breakfast, lunch, frankly, all day. And one afternoon, they kind of knocked on my door and, uh, you know, and came in and said, look, we've, you know, we've got, a, we've got a proposition, we've got a question, but, you know, hear us out, hear us out because they knew I'd sort of made a definite decision. I don't want to do that. I wouldn't be any good at it. And I'm not interested in getting up early. So they knew that there was a bit of persuasion to be done. And essentially somebody in there, in the second ladies novice crew at the college I was at had got injured and they needed an eighth bottom for the seat, as they put it. They were like, we don't need an athlete. We don't need somebody who's really skilled and talented. We're all beginners. We're having great fun. Why don't you try it? And initially I was sort of like, no, I'll look stupid. I'll be no good. But there was a part of me that was really envious of the camaraderie I could see and, and the fun they were clearly having. And I was really curious. And so, you know, I had one of those moments of, oh, I'm going to look stupid. Don't do it. But another voice kind of saying, why don't you give it a try? What have you got to lose? They were they were desperate, frankly, because they can't go out unless they've got eight people plus a cox. Yeah. And um, and so that's really how it started with a sort of, will you do it for three weeks so we can do the end of term novice competition? And then you don't have to do it anymore. So uh, they all reminded me of this, you know, for many years afterwards when they'd all left school, uh, all left college and got proper jobs. And I was the one that was still rowing two or three times a day, sort of full time at that point. That actually I initially had only signed up for three weeks under great protest and in the student bar with some definite persuasion going on. I think that that's actually a very good story because it allowed you to grow at the pace that you were ready for. And I've coached children and certainly in introducing children to sport, I've always felt that actually if you let them set the pace of their own enthusiasm, if they're not enthusiastic, that's fine. But you are do it for so, one term, or as you say, three weeks. You are so right because I joined that sport with – absolutely zero pressure expectations i mean anything wasn't even on the horizon frankly the may term two terms later wasn't on the horizon and you know what it allowed me to do was also just fall in love with the sport for what it was a totally mm -hmm. new experience and an incredible team experience i mean i'd felt so unconfident at school uh, because i wasn't good and everyone sort of labeled me as not good that i would opt out of what was still team sports. So if it was hockey, you know, I'd almost run away from the ball because I knew I'd fudge it. And, and I was so nervous about that moment. You know, I'd, I'd opt out 
when you get in a rowing boat, you can't opt out. It's pretty nuclear to opt out. It involves leaping into the into the river, which is freezing cold because at this point it's the winter. Frankly, that's it's quite difficult to do that, even with all the oars every all around you. So, you know, in that case, you've got no option but to opt in. It gave me, you know, just that freedom to opt in and have a go. And eh, that's what everyone is doing within a rowing boat. You're having a go, you're doing your own thing, but also whilst you're aware of you know what everyone's doing you around you and you're all making mistakes but you, you just got to keep going you've got to take the next stroke or you get the aura in the back of your you know in your back um and that was just actually for me so liberating to be not just introduced to sport but kind of almost given this permission just to have a go you've got no choice and i loved that as well because it got me completely over that well i'm not very good i'm not very confident and what am i going to do when the ball comes towards me you know there's none of that you've got another stroke to take just take it badly or you know skying or digging it doesn't matter just take it and then go up the slide and have another go and try and do it slightly better than the one before you know that again for me was just totally liberating and enabled me to access sport in a way i hadn't been able to before yeah i think the fact that no one can row really helps and I teach adults now and I remind them how hard it is for adults to try something new for all the reasons that you beautifully illustrated and how every Olympian started just as useless feeling as you are now and feeling as clumsy yeah. and, and and it's it's a great opportunity I think for people to find a to challenge their own brain and their preconceived notions in a positive way because pretty much everybody does basically learn in five or six lessons you've you've pretty much got the hang of it and um and, and that's a positive thing for life you're right and, and it is that supportive environment from the start you've got people around you so you're not learning on your own as sometimes in sports you might be you know again it's it's very collaborative from the start you know and you can help that person get in time you could you know it's in your best interests to help the others around you, which again is a lovely incentive, if you like, towards that putting the collective uh, interests first. Which again, you know, I really, I really enjoyed that people were so freely helping me. Of course they were, you know, uh, and, and that's a really lovely thing because actually, in you know, a lot of my again, my experience of school sport, they weren't. They didn't want to send the ball to me. They wanted to shut me out because they knew I was useless. So I felt, you know, that that actually they, they don't want to play with me. Whereas here, they were so keen to help me. Um, you know, again, that's a really different experience of sport. It really is. I was a, uh, I chose to be a goalkeeper at school for exactly that reason, because I didn't want the ball to be passed to me. And if they sent it to me and I could block it, that was good enough. <laughs> now, let's talk about the book. You, what a great motivation. And to write a book that is a, a business and life skills book, it's called The Long Win. What gave you the idea that you had a book in you? Oh, I've had various books swirling around my head for some time, uh, has to be said. But, um, you know, this particular one has been many years in the making. And, and at first I thought it was part of my own personal reckoning, if you like, of trying to make sense of that ferociously intensive period of my life living as an Olympic rower for 10 years where you eat, sleep and breathe rowing. And then to try and work out, you know, how did I do? How do I sort of become at peace with what happened and move on bearing in mind I didn't win every race probably lost a hell of a lot more than I ever won but okay I won a couple I did a couple of good things at the world class level and you know how do I sort of just you know understand it make sense of it and then kind of think about what that brings for the rest of my life and and move on and I mean even within that experience I'd also had a real shift in the culture that I'd experienced and the way I'd approached rowing. You know, in the early years, it started off, um, you know, when I left Cambridge, there was a sense of, you, you've had lovely time there. And even though it got quite serious in the boat race years, we had these wonderful coaches, you know, Ron Needs, Roger Silk, who did the best job of giving me a decent technical foundation and a total love of the sport. You know, it was all about the feel of the boat as well as the technique, as well as training. But then there was this sense of, right, you know, when, when I then kind of moved on to this, Olympic path. A path is a bit of a kind of elaborate word. Nowadays, there are pathways. Then it was sort of a bit of a, a kind of a messy dirt track through a forest to get into the squad. But, you know, once I sort of was within that world going to trials, then there was this fun like you had at university anymore. 
no, 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 no. This is pain. This is sacrifice. This is hours. This is total commitment. This is, you know, this has to come before anything that you ever do on any day in the re in the next part of your life. You know, if you lose, don't be happy. You must be miserable because winners are miserable. Um, you're not going to have any fun, basically, until you get on the top step. If you get the top, you can have fun when you win, but don't <laughs> expect to have fun long. All of this culture and I was like, wow, I've never encountered anything like this before. This is, oh, this is something else. But obviously, these people have been to the Olympics and won medals. So what do I know? I mean, I'm the I'm the new girl here. So I've got to learn to do this. So I spent the first part of my life in the kind of the first two Olympics, really, um, you know, trying to be the toughest, you know, trying to, to kind of commit and, and be as miserable as I could if I lost and all of these things. And, you know, it didn't really help me at all to go very fast. And what saved me really was, you know, in that third Olympiad, having stepped out, started the diplomatic career, got a completely different perspective, had a really disastrous second Olympics in Sydney. So it crashed, mm. failed big time, came ninth after coming seventh in, in the first Olympics. You know, so it almost just freed me of, of this world of thinking, do you know what? You know, I don't want to go back and do that again. Is there another way? And yeah. sports psychology was then just starting to shift towards this performance mindset thinking where we separate results and performance and we focus much more on what we're in control of. And every day we're just trying to improve. It doesn't matter what our ranking is every day. We're trying to get better than we were yesterday. We still want to win, but actually our best way of that is to forget about the results, which we can't control, and to focus on maximizing everything on a daily basis. And this, for me, was a much more helpful process to going faster. So I'd had this experience of, you know, the slight shift in culture. I mean, it was still only partly shifted. There's still a lot of that macho narrative around, but it had significantly changed, you know, the, the performance that I'd achieved in that final Olympiad. So I also walked away after Athens thinking, hmm, you know, what, what did I learn there? What was going on there? And, and I, you know, I hadn't really assessed it almost in, in, that, in the way I'm now describing it. I was kind of going, what, what was that all about? Which, of, which bits of that were helpful for me to keep thinking about and which bits should I have challenged sooner and what can I take into, into the next world? So, you know, I, I then thought, okay, you, you know, winning is a sports thing. I'm going to leave that behind. But actually the diplomatic world, um, you know, I was involved in a lot of political negotiation work, classic diplomatic work. And, and it's all about how you see success. Do you see it as a zero sum game that I can only do well if you do badly? You know, or can we shift people towards seeing success as something where we all gain? None of us get exactly what we want, but we're all part of something bigger. That is often at the heart of the negotiating challenge. Once we're in that binary thinking where one side success is purely defined by the other side doing badly, you, you, you're in a lose lose situation. Because if that side wins, it's only ever going to be temporary anyway, because it will cause another war or, the, you know, it won't last very long. Uh, it never works. So our challenge was actually about how we define success in and moving others thinking. I was like, wow, this is a really different take on the concept of winning. I then yeah. kind of in, the, in, in my sort of current work now in businesses with organizations have found this narrative coming up where I know I think they're particularly attracted to the thing called you're an Olympian come in. We want to win. We want to be number one. You know, come and teach us how to win. We want winning teams. And then I sort of ask a few questions about, OK, have you got good engagement, what are staff survey figures? No, that's what we wanted to come in and help people be engaged and motivated, right? So they're not motivated by that rhetoric then at the moment. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, what's behind wanting to win? Why do you want to win? Why do you deserve to be number one in your sector? And, and if and when you are, what's the responsibility that you're gonna have to, you know, change the way things are done, to lead your industry in a different way, to connect and change the lives of your, your customers or whatever your your kind of purpose is in a different way. And sometimes that there was nothing behind. Isn't it just about being number one? So I found again in business this sort of same obsession with quite narrow metrics, short-term metrics that lack in any meaning. And so it's this, you know, over time, over this sort of 15 years, if you like, or more, 20 years, this theme of winning was just swirling around my head. And I knew I had to write a book about it. Well, wow. And congratulations. And on that point, I'd like to read out a quick quote. Um, I often look for what is the core insight in a particular situation uh, that is useful. And Kath wrote this. How did you feel when you crossed the line? 
For a long time, I got wrapped up in introspection, trying to find the best answer until I realized that it was as much about the questioner as it was about me. It was about our shared needs to work out what constitutes winning and that pull to relate to someone else's experience, to make sense of our own criteria for success. And that for me was a massive eye opener. And it's it's like on about page three of the book. So how long did you actually spend trying to answer the how did you feel when you crossed the line question well i suppose it's been it's been an eternal question since athens and you know arguably it was the result in athens getting that silver medal that that you know left that needle of thinking well in lots of people's views i've just failed you know i'm the first loser in lots of that language that i've heard for years don't settle for second place you know second place is for losers you know no room for second place we're here to win we're here for the goal you know all of that stuff that you know you still hear on the yep. touchline even you know in parenting world you think oh my word um you know there was a lot of that resounding so you know i walked away from athens uh, you know, the BBC commentator kind of commentating on our race kind of goes, oh, here they come up to the line and they're only in silver medal position. So I thought, wow, that's really interesting. You know, what What do I, how do I make sense of that? What, what do I think is the case there? And so, you know, again, there was a lot of that result that sort of left me thinking, well, I know what some other people are saying about this. Not everyone. Lots of people are going, that's great. Right, but, yeah. You know, what, what's... What, what, what does it really mean? Um, and of course, it is a question that a lot of people, if I give talks, they'll say, how do you feel about coming second? And I mean, I remember talking to Greg Searle, who came fourth in Sydney, as well as winning a gold medal and a bronze medal. And he says the result that people ask him about is the fourth. What does it feel like to become fourth? And, you know, there was also for a, for a long time, I was thinking of just writing almost a bit more about this, this kind of finishing runner up. I think we're all fascinated in it because it happens to us all we're all go for a job interview and we're we're, we're the one that doesn't quite get it we're in the last two and we don't get it or we're at school and oh we didn't get the top prize you know it happens throughout our life and we're never quite taught how to manage that experience because it's all about winning we're here to win only the top place and then you sort of go oh what what, what does that what does that mean then how do I how do I sort of rationalize that so I think that you know it was a big spur to me to be for myself working out what that means and mm. you know and, and just this fascination and other people asking about it I was thinking that's quite interesting well good for you because it's taught me a lot about my own approach both as an interviewer and as a participant in sport now the book covers business politics and sport so the lessons are spread but the principle underlying it obviously is is very similar. Let's talk a little bit about sport for all, because your personal journey into sport as a reluctant sportsman is brilliant. And I'm sure so many people can empathize with it. What do you think from the um, long win book people can take into a sport for all mentality? So, I mean, I look at sport and I look at education as well. And I think, um, you know, there's there's a real loss, I think, in how much we're separating in a lot of our systems, the elite side from the participation side, which I don't think makes sense. And we've done a good job in the UK of proving you can have Olympic medals without improving participation. Uh, I don't think it means that's the only way you could have it. And I'd love us now to go on an experiment to see how can we connect these two up, uh, you know, up much more. I and mean, we, we see that also elite athletes often feel very isolated, very, very lonely. They struggle with transition. And I think, again, you know, if, if they were a bit more connected to the whole rowing community or the whole sporting community, whatever sport you're in, then actually those experiences would be quite different. So, you know, in, in my mind, I think we make some real false, um, you know, divisions between elite and participation. And right at the beginning, you know, we have all of this sort of obsession with sporting talent which means that a lot of school children, you know, myself totally included, you know, are discarded. Sport's not for you. I mean, that's literally what a teacher said to me. It's fine, you can do other things, don't worry about it, just don't do sport. But sport is about a healthy life. It's about enjoyment, it's about connection. The purpose of sport is actually that connection, the joy we have in watching the race, whether it's actually at elite level or grassroots level. And we've somehow lost sight of that and our obsession for these medals, the short-term medals, but what I want to know is kind of what's what's the medal bringing with it? What happens after the moment of the podium? And not enough in my mind, because we are not 
uh, you know, uh, enabling our sports to be openly accessible to everyone at the level that they want. You know, particularly at children's levels, there's so much talent spotting that is ridiculous. And there's a lot of research that says we cannot identify talent because of the different rates in which children develop. And of course, there's also often a big trend towards the, you know, the older ones that turn up do better just because they're older. And so the younger ones are discarded. I mean, there's so much nonsensical decision making that happens there because we feel it's the right thing to do. And again, I really want to challenge that because actually, um, you know, we all progress at different rates and that is the joy of sport. It's about a healthy life. Um, and actually, you know, by detaching the elite world, but also letting that elite world get less healthy in the process. There's a comment from someone who's watching live, which is, this is such an interesting question for rowing clubs to ask, especially as they can concentrate on pouring resources into the elite kids. Yeah, totally. And, and you know, I, I always think, what's uh, what, what are the stories as a, as a club? What are the stories you want people within that club to be telling? Do you want it to be about this sort of, you know, again, this sort of misery of the elite and then the others are discarded? We, we've lost on both counts then because we're creating an experience that's highly pressurized and not that much fun for the elite level. And the others, well, we just turned them away because they weren't good enough. You know, it's a lose-lose situation rather than actually, you know, enabling both of those worlds to be, you know, much more closely related um, and to be really encouraging more people into the sport because, you know, we need volunteers, we need coaches, we need, um, you know, we need, we, need. we need love. We need love for our sport, for what it is, and then for each person to explore where they want to take it. Um, you know, put the sport first rather than putting egos first is actually, you know, a large part of, of what I'm saying. It, we had an exact example of that recently. Our club, because of COVID, an awful lot of school kids didn't get to do their final high school regatta. Um, I'm sure this has happened all mm. around the world. Mm. As a result, when the club reopened, we had a huge influx of 18 and 19 year olds who wanted to carry on rowing, which is marvellous and very welcome. But the club has limited resources and is a high performance club. And so a couple of kids were politely told that they weren't going to make the grade. And instead of arranging for them to go somewhere else, they were let go. And one of the things that I am trying to introduce as a concept is that a master's rowing group is a group for adults who want to row not just people who are over 21 and fulfill a master's category it's for adults who want to go rowing some of whom want to race but many of whom are actually just happy being out on the water and for me that was a, a personal disappointment that I got told about it after it had happened and you know you have to change your constitution to enable you to welcome people who are you know participants and there for the fun of it so I think that you're right that it's a big challenge to the entire sport of rowing uh, as to how we welcome people and what we can enable people to do that they enjoy. You know, if you're an eight who just likes going for a row and then going out for breakfast, and is that fine? I mean, who's judging? How can it not be fine? How could we ever want somebody who wants to go rowing? How could we ever turn them away? I, I cannot really understand the logic there. I mean, I, I get the resource, there are resource issues, there's access to equipment, but fundamentally, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a sport that we all love. And I, I would want as many people as possible to be able to access that in the way that makes sense to them. There, you know, whatever sport we're talking about, we shouldn't be turning people away, you know, in that wider kind of social piece. I actually think a lot of our rowing clubs can be a real beacon in the community and there is a real challenge because it can be a clique it can be quite a narrow section of the community to, that, that row and that's actually not helping us either you know selfishly short term maybe that's okay but longer yeah. term we could play such a bigger role within the community with all sorts of different groups you know if you think of the kind of social challenges of obesity and mental health um, you know, and just that need, if you like, to to kind of have a community spirit that looks after us in challenging times as we've had this year, then again, you know, there's there's that bigger role. And, and in my mind, that's the, the bigger prize beyond the medals. It's that social responsibility that comes with being involved in sport that makes it worthwhile after the podium. Otherwise, the podium only lasts five minutes. But yeah. what happens after that? 
you know, that we talk about kind of winning gold medals for inspirational moments, but nobody defines inspiring to do what? Inspiring people to have another beer watching on the sofa, you know, or inspiring people to become part of sport. You know, I think we should be actually much more ambitious and not about lowering standards. I'm about broadening the framework within which we situate performance sport. And I'm about seeing a bigger potential in the power of sport to have a number of positive benefits across our communities. So let's talk a little bit then about how we teach coaches, because uh, rowing clubs are naturally generational and you tend to be taught by someone who themselves was a member of that club or another club in the past and who has learned their coaching in, in two ways. Most people learn by firstly having rowed themselves and being coached, received coaching. Secondly, they may go and do a, a program to get a certification as a, a coach from you know the National Federation. And then they learn on the job. And it's quite a it's a solitary you know experience. You very rarely have anyone other than your crew watching or listening to you coach. So what are the lessons for how we teach coaches? Yeah, I mean I think it's a really it's a really demanding job being a coach and I would love us to have you know much more of a support and development pathway if you like for coaches I think you know there's often an ex expectation that we're developing the athlete but the coach knows it all and that doesn't help the coach that puts a lot of pressure on them and actually doesn't give them the opportunity to to, to be on a constant learning pathway that the athlete should be on so I think there's a lot around, you know, having a, a seeing coaching as as you know the onward, the ongoing development that 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 it should have, rather than as a kind of now you know it, you know enough to be a coach and have the answers. I think you know coaches are often very isolated. We we have this sort of mantra of, you know, one coach per crew, and you live and die by your crew, and you don't want anyone else to coach them because they might go slower, and you actually also don't want anyone else to coach them in case they go faster. You know, and that. <laughs> That doesn't make sense either. So, you know, I would like to see much more sort of team coaching, peer coaching where you're out in a launch discussing what's, you know, what's happening. Because we all know that one coach will say something, it won't quite resonate, and we hear it in different language by somebody else, and it resonates with us. Doesn't mean one's better than the other. Just, you know, we all need to hear things, um, you know, in different ways before it kind of clicks with us. And mm -hmm. so, you know, again, there seems to be this sort of often quite a macho narrative almost around coaching, who the good ones are, who they are. And, and I think we need to kind of, you know, step back and think about creating a, an ongoing learning pathway for coaches where actually their job is not to come up with the right answers, but to learn to be a better coach all the time, to be thinking also less about developing the athletes and focusing on developing the environment into which the athletes come. So again, I think we overly fixate on individuals rather than thinking, you know, my job, you know, is, is, is to provide the environment. So they've got everything they need to improve, but then they need to make some choices. They need to step into things as well. Whereas we tend to get this sort of coach fixing athlete situation. We lose the autonomy. We lose the kind of joy of the sport. There's a lot of pressure on the coach. And, and that's not really working from a from any perspective, experience or you know the experience of being in that situation or the performance that comes from it. And it inevitably shortens the kind of uh, life of that relationship, if you like, or potentially the life of someone in the sport. I think we've got big retention issues at all levels, mm -hmm. grassroots to Olympic level. And that's a really useful lesson to think, OK, what are the things we need to change around the cultures? around the different responsibilities we have within that, the power balance, if you like, between the coach and the athlete, allowing ourselves to have more autonomy and allowing us to send to, to set success criteria beyond simply medals. It's that obsession for short-term winning that means we actually lose in the long-term because we can't carry on in this way year after year. And we also lose some of those bigger gains. You know, what, what are the students learning? when they're rowing, that's going to be useful for the career after rowing. Everyone will have a career after rowing. And so actually there's so much they could be gaining, you know, when, when they then think in that broader way. So that if you don't get the medal, it's not the end of the world. You know, there's a whole load of other stuff that, that goes with this. And, you know, that was a question that I can remember Chris Shambrat, the psychologist, sort of putting to me when I was coming back for that third Olympiad after two poor Olympic results, you know, we're going to do this differently. We're going to think about this differently. And, you know, it was like almost because I'd come ninth, now you can sort of accept that that's possible. And you're going to have to accept it's possible it could happen again. 
You know, in fact, you could come 10th, come 11th or 12th because there's 12 in the event. And I also now know that somebody who's completely committed, dedicated, you know, with lots of potential will come 9th or 10th. You know, I've been in that place. And rather than demonising it, it's almost like, do you know, it's perfectly possible. We need really good people in all of those slots, 1st to 12th, to make this a brilliant event that it is. So it kind of freed me up to accept that. And then we also kind of talked about what are you going to gain from this? If you don't win a medal, still really, really, really want to. It hasn't changed. But if you don't, what are you gaining that you'll take into that diplomatic career that I started in the year off afterwards? So that every day I had that sense I'm gaining something, you know, not that desperation of, oh, God, I hope this is going to be worth it on the day when, when the medals come in. You know, because that day might never come. You might not get selected or there might be a global health pandemic that cancels the Olympics, you know, or postpones it at least. Um, and so, you know, again, it just freed me up to be thinking about what are the other things I can gain from this? And I came with it with a really different approach each day, maximizing, you know, how I was interacting with others, you know, the things that I was getting, you know, the communication, the managing pressure, all of these things that would be useful to me after that, uh, the rowing career is finished. And of course, it enabled me to perform, you know, to the highest that I ever did in my career. And you got the silver medal. <laughs> Exactly. Won the World Championships, got the silver medal, you know, got on the podium when I really hadn't been near it for, for kind of years at that point. There are so many elements that go to making up a performance, aren't there? Yeah. I love what you said just now about peer coaching. So uh, one of the roles that I have tried to push myself into is representing masters to the federation and across the country connecting masters groups because there are lots of masters who don't want to race uh, self-evidently and one of the things that we're trying to do is we've raised some money to get some coaching going for masters and the model we've chosen is to teach someone we're hoping from every club how to peer coach with a, a mission to go back to their club and teach their club members how to peer coach so that coaches but some clubs have coaches some clubs have occasional coaches mm. some clubs have nothing and so how can we together give ourselves some focus that adds to our enjoyment and so I'll let you know in six months time or a year when we've rolled it out but this is something that I hope will be helpful because there are never enough coaches to go around and masters don't need uh, a coach every outing unlike kids for safety reasons so I, I'll be interested in hearing from any listeners if anyone else has tried introducing a peer coaching model. I mean, interestingly, I row as a master's row now in a four and we peer coach, I would definitely say. Um, do you know, the interesting thing is when I was looking at uh, the concept of winning in education and how, again, how obsessed we get about the grades and how competitive we make the classroom in a way that that actually isn't helpful to learning. So it becomes, you know, against your ranked against the people around you often. I mean, even in a kind of, you know, put your hand up first, you know, you, you're immediately in competition with others and you sort of don't want them to put the hand up before you. Or if they get chosen, you want them to give the wrong answer so that then they'll come to you and you'll give the right answer and you'll look really good. So we yeah. set up a lot of this kind of unhelpful competition against our peers in the classroom and there's a, a lot of research and literature around cooperative learning being far more effective there's a brilliant academic Alfie Korn K-O-H-N who has a website and, and amazing books where he really sort of criticizes our education system that overuses you know re rewards and star charts you know, and also sets up um, pupils against each other. And, you know, he shows that the most, you know, the much deeper learning comes from cooperative learning, peer learning within the classroom. So, you know, actually what, what you're doing is part of, I think, you know, what we need to do a, a, as a bigger challenge about what does good coaching look like? What does good being an athlete look like? What's our, all of our responsibility in learning and challenging each other rather than sort of this is what the coach does over here and this is what the athlete does over here. No, actually, we're, we're all kind of learning together. Um, we, we all need to be kind of co-creating the, you know, the improvements we make in the sport. So I think there's a big shift. And so I, it totally makes sense. Yeah, it really doing. does. Now, let's talk a little bit about school rowing, because obviously our commentator mentioned it and you've mentioned it. And in many countries, school rowing has become a sort of arms race where every year the training gets more intense there are more sessions more is invested and the winning culture is 
reinforced so many times and you've already mentioned some of the challenges of people of different age and who physically develop at different speeds but if if we were to challenge school rowing how would you suggest that they review their approach to it yeah so it's thinking about actually what's what's the purpose of school rowing what's the purpose of school sport well actually what's the purpose of school is it about winning at school and you're done at 18 and then you live the rest of your life or is school about developing um, habits and approaches and skills that you will continue to use for the rest of the life is school sport about setting you up for a healthy lifetime or is school sport about winning at Henley um, and I think that's the question that schools need to ask themselves and think about very carefully um, you know you, you, you're only going to live you're only going to sort of win once at Henley unless you're at Eton or St Paul's um, whereas I'd argue that you know every child that comes into your your school rowing or, or other school sports team um, we, we want to go on to have sport as part of their lives for the, for the rest of their life and that for me is the, the bigger game so I guess it's about re in my mind it's about redefining success and thinking about how you're measuring that um, you know actually I think the biggest measure should be how many of your children are still rowing 10 years later if we're looking at rowing how many of your you know how many of your pupils go on to live a healthy act physically active life um, that's by far more important to me um, that's the bigger gain, if you like, that they will, you know, stay in the sport, give back to the sport. You know, and I, I feel really sad about kind of stories that are told to me about, you know, children who are burnt out and leave school and never want to, to row again. Um, that's just not OK, because, you know, you, you, you've you damaged the sport. You've, you've taken somebody who might have spent a lifetime of being, you know, a, a coach and a chair of a club and a safety officer and, you know, just kind of still a master's rower you've sort of taken that away from somebody and I think that's that's really really selfish so I'm not against competitive sport but I think we have to have again broader success criteria so that's that's one aim but it needs to be situated within others so we put a framework around winning it's not the only thing um, you know, I, it's so important. And I, I was talking to a kind of rugby school recently, um, you know, and, and you know, they'd had a shift of, of teachers and, you know, having won the kind of this amazing school's uh, rugby trophy within a region and, and how wonderful that had been. And, and you know, thereafter, you know, never won it again because the culture was so rotten. And, you know, the, the next lot of school pupils didn't want to go into that. Uh, you know what what's the point of that it's very empty so we need to have sustainable cultures that you know are, are attractive to the next um generation coming in and and frankly also where we're we are providing that opportunity for those who aren't immediately top talent to stay in the sport because i often think i wouldn't get through these systems you know because i was coming in a, at, a, at a low level um, you know, how many people are you losing? We tend to have quite a narrow view of, I know what talent looks like. It looks like this, this and this. And they have this ergo score. And, and I think we lose people from our sport because they look a little bit different or, you know, they're just not fit enough to start with. And, and maybe they don't want to get fit really quickly. But maybe two years later, they'll have developed a maturity where they want to get fit or physiologically they'll be in a different place. I mean, the incredible Brownlee brothers, the triathletes, you know, Olympic medal winning, were not that strong in their teens. And I love the story they tell about how great that was because they, you know, it just as more with my beginning with rowing, they got to love the sport and they weren't expecting to win all the time and they just worked hard. So they had a great mentality that when their physiology suddenly developed at 18 it wasn't there in the teens suddenly at 18 they've got this incredible physiology and they've got the mindset and they love their sport you know that's so important you know they you might have looked at them and said oh they're not top talent uh, a few years earlier because they haven't beaten the you know all the, the, the school kids events or whatever it is um, you know, this is this is just madness trying to have a crystal ball and to predict this. And it means that we exclude people. That's not OK. So the sorts of things that a school rowing coach might put in place. And I have one example of Beryl Mitchell, who was a long term mm. rowing coach at Lady Eleanor Hollis School. She had a couple of things that she did that I was very impressed with. One is that the new 11 year olds who joined the rowing program were always taught 
in their novice first few sessions going out in a wobbly single, they were always taught by the oldest girls in the school. So the oldest knew the names individually of the youngest. And so that culture of not, uh, they, you know, yes, they looked up to them, I'm sure, but they were accessible and they knew them. You know, Kath was the one who put, picked me up when I fell in and, you know, popped me back in the boat. Uh, the other thing that she did was she ensured that every single school leaver got a certificate in coaching weightlifting because she said, whatever happens in your life, you've now got a piece of paper, a qualification that should enable you to get a job as a weightlifting coach, as a gym instructor, as, you know, as something healthy that, you know, even if you never use it again. And I just thought that that was fantastic for mm. thought, also setting the grain of an expectation in the athlete's mind that they would be continuing in some sort of sport later in life. Yeah, Do you have brilliant. Of other things that school rowers and coaches and leaders could be doing to set up this healthy framework? Yeah, I mean, I love that. It's 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 great examples of a broad of broader success criteria than purely that that result. We still want the result. We still want to do as well as we can, absolutely. But we're situating it with other things. That, I mean, it's not all or nothing. It's not oh, you're you know, it's amazing. You're the best in the world if you win, and and you're a total failure if you lose. That's just not healthy for anyone. So I think I, I love that kind of coaching others piece. And the course, that's very clever because the best way to learn something yourself is to coach others. So it, it's actually, you know, it's not pure altruism. It's actually helping you develop as an athlete. So again, I've seen uh, yeah, schemes like that where um, children are, uh, pupils are setting up, you know, not even in their own sport, but they're setting up, you know, a lunchtime activity club um, or actually, you know, also getting involved in, you know, nutritional information to the rest of the school, um, you know, again, thinking about how can what they're learning through rowing, how can they mm -hmm. offer that in a way that helps others? So, you know, thinking about that responsibility, you're an athlete, people look up to you, even when you're, you know, uh, within a school system, as you were saying, the older pupils, the ones who are in the top boat, or even just the ones who are in the rowing club, you know, they've got that level of discipline and commitment that, that people have a respect for. So therefore, you have a platform to give good messages about healthy life, about nutrition, um, you know, about discipline. And so, you know, actually adapting that into other, not just a rowing world, but actually taking that into school life uh, can be really, really helpful. There's a couple of comments from people watching live. Andrew Bateman has made a couple of remarks. He says, yes, I really think that young leaders programs should be much more accessible. So you learn to coach alongside at the same time as you learn to row. Yeah, it's great because, you know, that again, that's the bigger game. Not not only are we just creating good rowers, uh, we're creating leaders in whatever field they choose to go into. That's the bigger world, because how many people are actually going to become Olympia? And it's statistically it's very small. So rather yeah. than sort of having it that narrow, you know, we then lose on this bigger gain of thinking about the leadership skills that are being developed alongside your technique. And, you know, and sharing those with others and, and being proactive in sharing them then in, in the rest of your life. So absolutely. You know, are you creating just an elite rower or, yeah. you know, or are you creating actually, you know, a citizen and a leader? I think there's I, to me that success is in a, in a different level than, than than just a good rower. It's not enough. I want to be more ambitious. And, and I totally support it. So if you've been listening and you think you might want to start a conversation around some of the um, issues, but also some of the solutions that Kath's presenting, let's talk about how to have that challenging conversation with the people who are notionally in charge or running the show. Kath, where do you suggest someone starts? Do we make a list of all our failures? So, you know, I, I come back to, particularly if we're in a, in, a, in a sports world, we're in a performance world. And the, the obvious thing about performance in my mind is that we, we want to learn, we want to improve. We never have a perfect performance. We're always looking to improve. So I think it's really important that whether we're thinking about in the rowing boat or in the committee room afterwards, we have this ongoing sense of reviewing what's working and what do we need to change that avoids us getting stuck and enables us to have this ongoing conversation where we're saying, do you know what, I, I don't think this is working as well as it could. And rather than that being a, a threat to the status quo, 
that's fixed. We don't have a fixed status quo. We are constantly evolving. So we need to kind of have that underpinning philosophy that then makes the challenging conversation much less of a threat. Because it's like, look, here's a different way in which we might be able to improve. Can we pilot it? Can we experiment it? How are we going to explore whether this, this is a better way to do it or not? The challenge is when we don't have that sort of, when we don't all buy into that assumption that we are on a constant improvement pathway, then it's challenging because somebody's stuck and wants the status quo and you're challenging that. And when we're combative, that's really, really difficult. So there's something about actually before we get to the point of having to have a challenging conversation, let's set ourselves up to be, you know, reviewing what's working, what do we need to change year on year, month on month, committee meeting to committee meeting so that we are always used to being open to change, looking for change, deciding which one, which which area we're going to challenge next. Um, and, and the challenge is, is the norm. I think that those things can definitely make it easier. But certainly my experience of running change programmes is it's always worth starting with the willing and being very open about what you're talking about. So people can observe and reflect in their own time and make their own minds up uh, because you're not going to persuade everyone from the get go that your idea is marvelous. Um, and, you know, there is the fear of failure is is innate in every human being. And so starting with the willing and then using the feedback and the lessons to contextualize the ongoing learning as the underpinning can I mean, be helpful. Um, you know, the, the the biggest kind of lesson from the diplomatic world and all our negotiating training and just our kind of ongoing reflections was always that people really need to be heard, like really heard and really listened and feel that they have been totally heard and understood, even if you don't agree with them. And actually, that basis is a great place to start. Make sure we are really hearing people, not just letting them speak, they've got five minutes, then we carry on with our view. We need to actually listen. There's usually a kernel of truth in every perspective. And so, you know, there is that kind of common courtesy about making sure we listen because we inevitably have got assumptions about people's positions that are never entirely accurate. So, you know, it's a simple thing, but quite often, and, and you know, the whole world of mediation is really based around um, listening much more closely, much more attentively, listening to listen, not listening to, you know, to, to, to misunderstand or listening just to for the gap for you to talk. One of the things that I've heard is in a situation like that is to listen and then to repeat back to the person in your own words what you have heard and if they say yes that's exactly right then you can move on but if they say no you haven't fully understood then there's an opportunity to go around the loop again and for them to fill the gaps to clarify your understanding so it takes longer but it does well, yeah. short short term, it takes longer. I think in the long term, it, it probably doesn't, because I think if you have misunderstandings, then you clash heads for a very long time. There, there's a lo there's a lovely kind of um, there's a foundation in America called the Long Now Foundation that's looking at trying to sh shift us to much more long term thinking, and they set up debates where a bit like you were describing there, you have sort of two two views to an issue, and the aim of the debate is to is is not for one to win. It's for each to have a deeper understanding and the audience to understand both views more deeply. And what they do is the first person, you know, gives their position, describes it. And then the next person must describe what they've heard accurately to the level that the first person is comfortable with before they then give their view. And then that, that first person will then again describe what they've heard. And that is how it ends. It doesn't end with a, who do you vote for or who's got the most forceful argu argument, which is where you get to. You get to who's the best, who's got the best rhetoric, who's the best orator. If you're in a sort of battle, you're actually just seeking greater understanding. And that is the goal. And I think that's actually really quite a great challenge 
to you know our assumptions about who's got the best arguments because the person that wins out doesn't have the best arguments and very often there isn't a simplistic situation where one is right and one is wrong either we don't live in that binary world and we should stop behaving as if we do I'm a geographer by training and we were always taught that a multidisciplinary approach will bring you a better mm. solution. So perhaps the challenge here is for the club chairman or the committee chairman to actually be the person who doesn't give their views, but mediates and moderates that flow of understanding or seeking the flow of understanding. Yeah, there's a big shift in kind of leadership development away from seeing the leader as the one who who's the big kind of uh, the hero, the decision maker. They know everything to the leader facilitating the great ideas around them and kind of mediating. And, you know, from there emerges the best way forward rather than who's right, who's wrong. Because I said that, you know, a lot of the, the kind of issues we're dealing with, complex issues of you know, climate change, global inequality, global health, these aren't win, lose, right, wrong issues, just as frankly, rowing technique as well, you know, isn't right, wrong, there are different ways you can do it. Um, in, and, and so, um, you know, that, that change in how we uh, set up the conversations around, you know, what are we going to try next? Um, rather than who's right, who's wrong, it's so important at every level. I think there's a, a feminine approach to that. I think women find collaboration much uh, an easier technique to um, to approach. That perhaps we practice it more. Um, so that that might be a, a very good way of of bringing women up in your organisation. Should you want to, I mean, I think I think you're right. Uh, typically, that has been the case. I think sometimes um, there is a, a masculine. Uh, sort of image set up that to be strong, to be considered a leader, you need to behave in quite a kind of macho heroic way. And there are a lot of women that will do that as well, because they feel that's what's required to get promoted. But again, that kind of works if things are very simplistic and you've got all the answers. But in most organisations and in most rowing club, no one person has all the answers, in which case it no longer works very well, male or female. Exactly. And it's only the change in personnel that brings new ideas in, which does happen sometimes, but it happens less, I think, in volunteer sporting organisations. Yeah. And I mean, that's another kind of challenge to why we need to be a bit more inclusive, why we shouldn't be so quick to kind of turn away the people who don't quite look as if they fit into, you know, the, the different categories we've got. Because you know what? Those people could offer exactly the, the things that we've got gaps in, in terms of how we run the club, how we might reach different communities, how we might do things differently. So, you know, there, there's definitely a case for, for, you know, being more proactive about being more inclusive um, for, for that very reason. Kath. Just a reminder for everybody, it's called The Long Win, the book by Kath Bishop, and you can get it at all good bookstores, self-evidently. Now, to end with, Kath, I'd very much like to ask you, have you got a rowing tail for me? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a number. Um, the, the one, the, the, the tail that actually sprung to mind first, which is quite interesting, is from absolutely years ago when we went on this slightly chaotic uh rowing trip to to race in Galway the beautiful city of Galway or town of Galway in Ireland and it was a really extraordinary race because normally you sort of race around bridges and corners and things like that but in this race in the middle of the river there were some old monuments sticking up that you had to avoid um and we had a really inexperienced cox and we went out in the afternoon um, we'd already sort of slightly, you know, scratched the bottom of the boat on on a couple of sort of old bits of monuments sticking up in the river. And I can just remember sort of down the actual race, you know, rather than you be saying, you know, up to or, you know, tighten the catches or, you know, bridge coming up. I just remember going monument, monument coming, <laughs> monument on the left, another monument. And I just thought that was kind of one of the kind of craziest calls that I've given from the stroke seat to this Cox who is, you know, as I knew we were about to kind of basically launch ourselves and potentially get stuck on the middle of this monument, a very ancient monument in the middle of the Galway River. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. You're getting lots of laughs from people who are watching live on Facebook. <laughs> I'm, I'm now going to have to go and look at photographs of the river in Galway and find out what these monuments are. Yes, although there are probably a little bit less of them now since we've raced there. Uh, yeah, I know. I feel I ought to know that question. I'm going to go and look up too. 
Kath, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you for your huge investment in time and writing the book, but then also interpreting it and bringing it to the sort of consciousness of the rowing community through Rowing Chat. Um, it's been marvellous. Now, can you tell the listeners where they then can connect with you? Sure. So I have a website, kathbishop.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at the Kath Bishop. I'm on Instagram, Kath underline Bishop. So pretty easy to find LinkedIn as well. And, you know, love to hear any feedback on the book, any questions, any thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm really enjoying the kind of opportunity to connect with a lot of different people um, through the ideas that, that I share there. Thank you ever so much. And to all our listeners, please like us and uh, continue to subscribe to Rowing Chat. And tell your friends, please, if you've enjoyed this episode, share it and tell one new person what you've learned today. So till next time. Bye bye.